All right. So I think uh, we are live and good to go. Um, I'll go ahead and, uh, and give you an introduction, John. Uh, just for people who are watching from other places, John will give his talk and then he's uh, very open to questions after. So it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. John Bodner, who will be um, talking about beautiful machines, exploring the genre and narrative mechanisms that make conspiracy theories work. This is part of our Friday Light and Formal Research Talk series, where uh, researchers from Grenfell and from around the world sometimes uh, come to share the work that they're doing uh, with a broad audience. So I'm very much looking forward to uh, to Dr. Bogner's talk. And um, yeah, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and take it from here. Great. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you for everybody for attending and for your interest in this talk. And I'm going to... Um, so one second here, just a couple of technical things. <clears throat> So some of this talk is speculative and it's early work. This is things that academics say so that other academics don't get mad at them. Um, but um, I'm gonna give a prepared presentation with some PowerPoint slides and hopefully leave a good amount of time to answer your questions at the end. And as Daniel said, type them into the chat. If there's something you know imperative that you need answered right away, um, I don't know, put it in all caps and maybe Daniel can interrupt me while I'm talking if something's not very clear. As the caution notes, we are going to be talking about some disturbing details. If that disturbs you, then try not to be disturbed or to um, perhaps see this um, talk in a way that allows you to control the pacing or what you're seeing, maybe as when it, after it's recorded. When we finished our book on COVID-19 conspiracy theories, we knew there was much left out and unsaid. Masculinity wasn't covered. Q hadn't yet been unmasked, but now largely is. The nature of political conspiracy theories was thin in the volume, but one of the main things that's troubled me in recent reporting and scholarship on CTs is how increasingly reductive the investigation and analysis has been. Complex CTs are rounded up in a summary. Members of conspiracy theory communities are just individual believers or pigeonholed and simplistically labeled. And there's an increasingly positivistic and medicalized paradigm advanced via psychological studies to explain conspiracy theories and their practitioners. All of this without really knowing even what conspiracy theories are in the first place. And I'm not sure we're going to solve that problem in this talk, but we're going to talk about some of its features. Now, the purpose of this talk is to highlight some of the lesser explored avenues of CT research and to demonstrate how a folklore perspective can advance our understanding of the genre, practice, and consequences of CTs. I want to begin with an example of a typical conspiracy theory thread that I captured on a Facebook group that's dedicated to defeating the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, and the Liberal government. This might be an odd choice of a field site, but beginning in February 2020, I sort of accidentally found uh, by covering COVID skeptics and anti-lockdown communities instead of, and it was a, a, a purposeful choice, instead of going to um, traditional conspiracy theory sites on Facebook, I went to the places which they were slowly populating. Um, so for example, the COVID skeptic crowd, um, and particular right-wing groups that were skeptical of lockdowns. So this is how I came across our first example. Now, I'm gonna risk boring you with content to try to solve a key problem in popular reporting on conspiracy theories. Researchers rarely look at them in context and they rarely analyze them as performed expressive acts. There's also a sneaky reason. I want you to experience the way c tiers communicate. I want you to play conspiracy theory, where's Waldo? If you spot a CT, give yourself a point. If you know the CT, give yourself another point. We don't have prizes. Like conversations, Facebook threads begin with a topic. In this case, that uh, Ghislaine, Ghislaine Maxwell, former partner of Jeffrey Epstein, has a list and Justin Trudeau is on it. Basically, the meme declares Trudeau a pedophile, rapist, and sexual predator. Of course, there is no list. This thread is from December 2020. There's nothing particularly of note in the news that might have occasioned this post. The indictment against Maxwell was in October 22nd, 2020, 
And so it would have kept her name as current events and C tiers involved, uh, sorry, and conspiracy theorists involving a mysterious list of international elite pedophiles has been nurtured by QAnon for several years. The idea of a list has its genesis in Epstein's flight manifest, which uh, recorded people who flew in his plane over several years to his private island. Of course, at this point, nearly every celebrity or politician someone wants to attack has had their name photoshopped onto the list. In fact, it's actually quite hard to find the original list these days. So the thread begins much like a contemporary legend or rumor with a topic, a presentation of information and a person who is important to the group. What follows is the process of accretion by which communities of conspiracy theorists use small statements and memes to collectively construct a vast conspiracy. I've likened this process to what folk call, folklorists call the family saga, the vast and unending story of a family that is made up of thousands or tens of thousands of individual tales, which are not held by one person, but are collectively woven together by family members at family gatherings like weddings and funerals. For example, we immediately have, why is this not advancing? Okay. So there was a bit of a delay there, but we immediately have um, a second uh, conspiracy theory that reinforces the theme and begins forming the larger conspiracy theory by assembling separate instances of proof of a wider plot. The roots of this second story appear to be a political conspiracy theory advanced by shadowy conservative operators in Canada. They keep trying to spike the news cycle with it, but unlike the right wing media ecology in the US, it hasn't risen up from the fringe online news sites to enter into the mainstream media in Canada. Now, Rebel Media is our low rent Fox News, but it really is quite marginal, if nevertheless an influential site, and it has picked up or played with elements of this conspiracy theory. Next, we have a little bit of a disagreement. Um, between the poster, responders, and B, B being your friendly neighborhood researcher. Then we have a reinforcing uh, in, of the first point. Here, we have the infamous B logo, whose origins date to a 2007 FBI internal document that was leaked as part of a WikiLeaks dump. QAnon and Save the Children have been spotting this symbol everywhere for the last few years and is actually similar to several conspira uh, contemporary legends about Satanist images that appear in, say, cereal, on Oreos, uh, in packaging for companies. The only sign of dissent with the uh, general thread's consensus that Trudeau is a pedophile is the lack of a link or proof. You'll see this pop up throughout our little tour. Now, this one is a bit complicated. The key innovation of QAnon to the pandemic is to tie in the Save the Children wing of Q. Briefly, QAnon predates the pandemic and emerges out of Pizzagate from 2016, originally a political conspiracy theory in which the deep state is being battled in a benevolent conspiracy by Donald Trump and a cabal of white hats. Save the Children emerges out of a small cluster of Q drops about Satanism, pedophiles, and human trafficking, which QAnon used to try and integrate, co-opt, and build a vast conspiracy out of the Pizzagate wreckage. It worked. For quick reference, Save the Children is just the moral crusades from the 1980s and 90s satanic panics, now with keyboards and an internet access. This whole bundle gets folded into the pandemic by arguing that Trump is exploiting the lockdowns, which he doesn't support, but they allow him to bottle up all of the evil satanic elite child murdering Satanists. Thus the fascination with fictitious ankle bracelets. The whole thing never made much sense in the Canadian context, but QAnoners in Canada view Trump as a kind of international superhero who has such power that he can defy national borders Thus, how he can force Sof um, Sophie Gregor Trudeau to leave England and return to Canada.
This one is going to take some explaining and congratulations if you've already know it or spotted it. The piggy farm, and you'll see reference to this throughout the other posts, refers to Robert Picton's farm in Port Coquitlam, a city bordering Vancouver. Picton is a Canadian serial killer who was convicted in 2007. He may have murdered and sexually assaulted as many as 49 women, many of whom were indigenous involved in the sex trade. The blatant sexist and racist roots of police inaction on these missing women over a 15 plus year period of time is infamous in Canada and part of the roots of the national inquiry into missing and murdered indig indigenous women and girls which it issued its final report in 2019. Trudeau gets wrapped up in Picton's orbit in a few ways, and I'm only gonna to touch on two very briefly. First, through a series of increasingly tenuous links that make the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon look sensible, it turns out Trudeau is a silent partner in Picton's um, farm, as well as his crimes. In the second version, the farm is a honeypot sting operation used by a shadowy international cabal to ensnare elite pedophiles and traffickers by recording their crimes and controlling them to bring about the new world order. Oddly enough, Trump was accused of falling into a honey trap in Russia, but I digress. This and previous examples are clearly a crude grafting of an American save the children into the Canadian context. But there is a long tradition of Canadian participation in the satanic panics of the 80s and 90s. So there are both traditional narrative and sociological models for people to adopt and use when creating and adjudicating these narratives. Soros's lapdog is a direct importing of the anti-Semitic Jewish puppet master trope. A picture of then Deputy Prime Minister Christina Freeland with George Soros and later one with Trudeau has been constantly circulating in Canadian conspiracy theory communities. Just as a side note, the amount of homophobia and transphobia in these groups I'm following is quite astounding, but not unpredictable. Still, no links to the list. Oops, sorry. So here we get people complaining about links. Again, digging at this particular non-scandal. Um, also, obviously, this is not a, a reputable news site, um, although many, what I found sort of interesting in following CTs uh, is that more and more proliferation of online news sites um, increasingly use um, terms uh, so that the click, um, or at least the, their presentation as a link looks very um, professional, right? Uh, frustration that uh, with the list not being presented does boil over and a rare note of disagreement with the thread is evident. Um, this particular report is from August 2020 and it recycle recycling old news reports as new is common in conspiracy theory threads and clearly many people do not click on them. Um, this is also a very poorly done blog based conspiracy theory site. Um, for our foreign uh, attendees, Jody um, here, really closest thing I can guess is that it must allude to Jody Wilson Raybould, Canada's former justice minister and attorney general, a member of the Kwakwala First Nation and the highest indigenous office holder in Canadian history. As well, it's an odd choice as an accomplice to cover up crimes against indigenous women. While the deep state narrative never caught on in Canada because the state is controlled by the enemies of anti-lockdown and anti-system activists, we have here something like a vast conspiracy cabal that has seized the state. This is a minor point in a lot of the Canadian CTs. This one here is clearly a callback to Pizzagate and the leaked emails of DNC Chairman John Podesta and Hillary Clinton by Russia. I reviewed the archive and the Trudeau references are banal and I don't think we're ever looped into the narrative of a secret code to talk about sexually abusing children. This callback does, however, remind posters of the long link between Epstein, Democrats, Maxwell and Epstein sexual crimes. 
Looping Trudeau in is easy here by simply mentioning the emails, but not having to prove that there's any actual affective or effective um, content. The fact that no one overtly disagrees with this post is generally taken as polite indifference or positive agreement. Now, Facebook posts are obviously measured by reactions, but a lack of likes doesn't mean that the post is unliked, only that it is unremarkable, meaning it fits within the community's aesthetic of ethical system. Um, this particular one persists right up to the January 6 riots and might have morphed into something new since I was last paying attention. The narrative is that Trump has secretly expanded uh, Guantanamo Bay to withhold upwards of 20,000 people who will be rounded up in the purge of the deep state, commonly called the storm. Canadians and other countries supporters of Trump believe that he will also be arresting their leaders. How they are going to affect this has never quite been explained. Here we return to the possibly fictitious pedophile logo and the old but evergreen conspiracy that Trudeau is the illegitimate love child of Fidel Castro and Margaret Trudeau. This narrative appears predominantly in Trudeau, uh, in narratives that Trudeau is an unreconstructed communist fifth column for the Cuban government narratives a fairly obscure but entertaining subgenre of conspiracy theories, anti-Trudeau conspiracy theories. Here we see the traditional call to action found in conspiracy theories, as well as most contemporary legends. And um, a shout out to prolific anti-Trudeau conspiracy theorists, um, uh, mainly operating on YouTube. Uh, this is actually quite an obscure one. Uh, the Shermans were billionaire Toronto pharmaceutical manufacturers who, whose murder in 2017 is still unsolved. Trudeau's reason for murdering them are odd and have recently reflected various um, uh, pharmacological, uh, sorry, <laughs> pharmacy and um, and pharmacy based, you know, pills, uh, vaccines, and vaccine rollouts conspiracies. Since the company also produced hydrochloroquine. Now, Trudeau's contract killing of powerful people to his own advantage is clearly based on the Clinton murder legends, um, which has been presented by uh, several folklores. Now, how do you feel at the end of all that? Overwhelmed, disoriented, alienated, confused, perhaps comforted. Part of your disjuncture from the flow of information and the community that made it is because of the formal features of this type of story sharing. I'll return to this point in a minute, but some people argue that conspiracy theories have no form or structure, that they are all content. With this Facebook thread, we can see one traditional formal feature of the conspiracy theory. What you saw looked like a series of statements, but they are what folklorists call kernel narratives, or uh, Tim Tangerlini calls them imminent stories. Kernel narratives are curious little things, and we use them every day. If you're talking with a knowledgeable person, a friend or family member, we will often refer to share stories with just a line or even a title that we've invented for the story. There's no need to recount the whole story since we know it. It's an efficient mode of telling tales. But it also has a way of denoting insider or esoteric knowledge from outsiders. Kernel narratives form a network of shibboleths, which act to test participants to see if they can get the information. When they do get it, the experience confirms their place within the group and reinforces their positive identity as knowledgeable insiders. For those who don't get it, there are two possible responses. The first one we saw with people telling me to Google it, this is equivalent to the internet slapdown, now archaic, lurk more. Basically, newbies don't deserve the group member's time. Thus, the stories act as ways of, of gatekeepers and moderating membership. A second likely hypothesis is that some of the members of this group are not proficient and effective storytellers of the genre. So casting off the inquiry, telling people to just Google it, Protects, protects them from the negative social consequences of a bad performance. 
Finally, directing people to search out the truth, sometimes with a link or a YouTube channel, which we saw several examples of, ensures the person is exposed to increasing amounts of conspiracy, conspiracy theory content, along with predictive algorithms that researchers have identified leads to increased narrowing of information ecosystems and possibly radicalization. Moreover, the person is learning how to navigate information ecosystems with which they may be unfamiliar, but nevertheless are important to their new conspiracy theory group members. Remember, of course, that conspiracy theorists routinely reject the mainstream media. The beauty of a kernel narrative is that they are imminent stories. Poke them and a larger and richer version can appear. For example, these ones, which I'm not going to leave up for you to read all of them. So what can we take from this exercise thus far? Conspiracy theories are accretive, made up of discrete small units that are put together through participatory storytelling, much like all folkloric cultural texts. We can step back, if we can step back into an historic oral culture, what you saw and heard, what was transmitted between people over time were the successful texts. They were the ones a community of people agreed collectively said something important about themselves. The unsuccessful narratives disappeared like snow falling over open water. The big mistake people make is assuming that the internet is what allows this collective storytelling. And we see this all the time, especially in popular reporting. The only thing new about the internet is that we can more clearly see the process because it is date and time stamped. And the internet also preserves the failed narratives, which is an important data point in understanding how a community of C tiers fashions a canon of conspiracies. A canon is a shared, collectively held, and constantly maintained body of core narratives to a particular folk group. People who participate in fan culture will recognize canon from the endless arguments over what is in and what is out, as will every tired English grad student. Repertoire can be thought of as a group or individual stored knowledge of texts or cultural practices from which a person can craft a performance, while performance is the materialization of cultural knowledge, form, content, and a host of subtle, unalterable, deep knowledges. For a folklorist, or at least folklorist I like, nothing is this but that it is performed. When performances are judged to be successful, a community acknowledges this fact and may adopt the content, form, or various performances for themselves and pass it along. Now, folks make a big deal out of memes, but folklore is memes before memes was cool. The implication of all of this babbling is that CTs are social products. I think a fundamental mistake some researchers are making when it comes to CTs is that they reduce the appeal or, to use an old French cultural theory term, pleasure of the text. Insofar as it confirms uh, to a laundry list of, say, biases or beliefs or worldview and the like, certainly that's part of it. And if we have time, I'll return to this point. But more importantly, CTs are collective doings, a communitas made through convincing fictions. Failure to appreciate this point leads to poor understanding of the stickiness of conspiracy theory subcultures that, and their seemingly cult-like configurations. You may have heard the QAnon was such a successful conspiracy subculture because of the way it turned CTs into an interactive game. And this is partially true, but what is underappreciated is that QAnon assigns various roles and tasks to volunteers, people who go out and scrape for clues to current events that might help explain a Q drop, which is a cryptic pronouncement that, had, that, that QAnon, the Anons, had to decipher. Now, other people in the group would collate the data, and finally, someone would a session organize and upload the hall into a shared collective archive. It was like a Harry Potter fan site, but instead of wizards, people were planning a bloody insurrection. More seriously, those various roles gave people a status in the online community, a sense of purpose and belonging. It is the laboring that makes one part of the group not merely a shared sense of worldview or beliefs, or even feeling like the stories have something to tell you. 
Finally, Tim Tangerlini and a team of big data researchers have observed or observed that the structure of a CT repertoire is a good indication of whether or not it is a conspiracy theory or a true conspiracy. With the former presenting an accretion structure of several interlocking but not interdependent conspiracies and associated narratives. Let's take a brief look at two um, sort of standard uh, things that folklorists do, um, content and form. Form is the shape of a tale, um, form, sorry, or the shape of a tale is central to a people's generic classification system. Genres with strong formal features like folk tales will announce their presence. Think of the classic once upon a time. Right. While others like contemporary legends can slip into and out of a conversation with barely a notice, since they can sound like news or current events. For example, be careful or the cops will take you down to Cherry Beach and beat the shit out of you. Was a contemporary legend I initially collected as news from a number of Toronto street kids. The utterances on both on this slide both contain conspiracy theories about Gates, but neither looks like the other and none of them look, looks much like narrative. The problem with CTs on one level is that CTs pretend to be nonfiction, research reasoned, uh, reasoned and texts which conform to the basic rules of academic and scientific discourses. One curious feature of CTs is that they are immensely pragmatic in their camouflage, in their camouflage tracing a society's zones of knowledge production the conventions by which they operate and the epistemological regimes that they produce. They will co-opt these zones for their own use. See, say, the whistleblowing nurse, whistleblowing doctors, rogue scientists, who are either a full uh, conspiracy theory participant or provide key data that can be woven into conspiracy theorist narratives. On the other side, and shading closer to political conspiracy theory, is that during the pandemic, CTers have ruthlessly attacked and built upon historic CT attacks um, upon the media, science, now whether that science is done at the level of the CDC, research universities, or the pharmaceutical industry. They eventually turned on doctors and nurses with the film your hospital movements and related CTs, which are still ongoing in the US and Canada. And of course, they turn on university researchers in general as indoctrinators or elite indoctrinators. Now, usually Marxist feminist elite indoctrinators, but we don't want to get too specific or describe me. Um, so these people who research CTs themselves become obviously the object of this deconstruction project. Now, in many ways, CTs are the bastard children of Thomas Kuhn whose deconstruction of scientific normal research was, would presage the rediscovery of the hermeneutics of suspicion by various schools of critical inquiry, which has influenced three generations of scholars. But suspicion, with conspiracy theory but suspicion within conspiracy theory communities and their mantra to trust nothing has produced something very Greek tragedy-esque where the children of what were the children academics produce spend all day every day plotting academia's death with the tools of critical inquiry we forge to unbind our texts from the shackles of received dogma. It is doubly ironic when QAnon and other more fascistic groups would reapply said shackles in the name of free thinking and in all caps freedom. Now, let me briefly return to form from that digression, rant, something. As I noted, the first formal feature is that they pretend to be nonfiction. They purport to use language and other forms of representation to accurately encapsulate the real world, its material existence, its phenomenon, phenomenological integrity, and the actors therein. I've recently begun to describe this relationship and orientation as grounded fiction. This lies at the heart of a reinterpretation of the formal features since it describes the internal logic governing the construction of most CT statements, as well as their longer and more developed form as vast or super conspiracy narratives. Second, it helps to account for the relationship between describing discrete features or phenomenon and the theory which explains the relationship between them. 
Now, admittedly, this is a new avenue of work that I'm just starting on with much more to do. But it does let me say that when taken collectively, as Tangerlini has done, we see CTs as agglomerations of discrete narrative units. Finally, back at the level of short statements, CTs mimic somewhat contemporary legend, legend's super efficient storytelling style, where setting, character, action, resolution can be presented in small, very small packages. Here, similar elements exist. Recall Bill Gates' material that we've seen here. Um, we have character, setting, action, resolution, all in a tight, small package, and generally reflecting the accretion of other elements into a unified whole. Some scholars have claimed, as I said, that there's little difference between contemporary legend, rumors, and conspiracy theories, and they might be right. But in future work, I will be arguing that outside the obvious presence of conspiracy, there are formal and content differences that can be discerned. If we move from form to content, we can apply some uh, traditional folklore techniques and inter of interpretation. For example, Bill Gates is so surrounded by narratives at this point, he would give folktales character Jack a run for his money in the number of narratives in which he's the main character. Like traditional folktales, Gates' stories are constructed out of motifs, and part of the tale reflects Vladimir Propp's basic observation that characters in a tale merely fulfill a role in service of the narrative. Gates is the great antagonist, trapping the unwary in his wiles, a kind of blue beard or a less complex Baba Yaga. His victims are a culturally appropriate, imperiled group, generally women and children, hopefully uh, more generally white women and children. He is the wolf in Little Red Riding Hood. And finally, while his devices appear very modern, they're rooted in traditional motifs of poison, bewitchment, control, and concealment. Even the shape, and here I'm nodding back to form of the tales are rooted in various story models, most obviously various apocalyptic traditions, um, of which Christianity is the main sort of wellspring in the North American CT tradition and expression in various Millerite end of days texts and practices. The reoccurring technique of framing conspiracy as an existential crisis of the now is not only emotionally manipulative, but it, is, is, but it is at its heart based upon an anesthesiology with political implications. This slide is of William Miller, famed for his spectacular predictions that the world would end on March 21, 1843. In this prognosticating failure, he is also joined by Q, who has never seemed to get a future date right. Now, the inventiveness of the CT is that the true hero stands outside of the story. The narrator and transmitter is the great hero, the truth seeker and the truth teller who exists within a wider framing narrative, whose job in the imagined and real community of CTers is as a master of meta narrative, a story that tells the story of the wider context of the individual and the CT community itself. In these tales, they position themselves much like the king's daughter who builds the storytelling in, in the Newfoundland version of Jack of the Jack tale that um, Herbert Helper collected called Peter and Minnie. The storytelling in, like say, eight Kung or QAnon practitioners, is a place to reveal the truth and identify those who tell, to reward them, to preserve the space for future tellers and the preservation of the truth. Now here we tread very closely to a whole new topic on deep stories and models for narrative making, but we're gonna have to leave that for today. Let me end with one last observation. Conspiracy theories contain implicit and explicit identifications of threats and clear guidelines for eliminating that threat. When people act out a narrative, folklorists call that ostension. Other people might call it a riot, an insurrection, or various criminal activities. But it is a story brought to life, and stories and folklore matter. So thank you very much for your patience, and I look forward to your questions. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. 
All right, so we have um, comments and questions that can arrive both from Facebook and from WebEx. Um, if people want to speak their question out, they can raise their hand in WebEx and I'll, I'll call on them. Uh, for Facebook, you can just type in your question and um, we'll take it from there. So I'll start off with, it uh, looks like a comment from uh, Joel on, uh, on WebEx here, who says there's a list, both the flight manifest, but also Maxwell, uh, who had a little black book with many politicians on it, just all the people she knew, there's therefore a small truth that uh, the conspiracy theory can form around. So I'm not sure if uh, you have more that you want to add in there, Joel, or if you uh, have any thoughts about that. No, no, Joel's sorry. right. I'm sorry, I did forget about the Black Book. Um, however, I'm not too certain that the Black Book has been absolutely released and, and available widely to folks. Um, it's kind of like a holy grail uh, for some CTers. But thanks, Joel. I, I, I left out the Black Book. You're correct. Quite, quite correct. So there can be a, a tiny grain of truth sometimes, but not necessary. Oh, yes. No, uh, the tiny grain of truth is vital and important. Um, whole cloth fabrications uh, don't uh, don't last very long in the um, in the CT communities, constant editing. Great. All right. We have a question on Facebook from Kevin Young. How do we deal with experts uh, in quotes, scare quotes there in certain fields that support conspiracy theories uh, further confirming their theories? <laughs> Uh, yeah, the Jordan Petersons of the world and other such folks, um, or um, the recently founded um, Nurses Against Lockdown group. So how does a professional organization uh, deal with um, their own practitioners um, acting against um, uh, community health practices? Uh, I support tenure and the protection that it gives us. <laughs> That's my official position. Um, All right. Yeah, I think um, I think part of the difficulty that we have as uh, let's say academics um, and let's see some members of our own fraternity are active in conspiracy. Um, part of the problem that we have is that we're very, very busy and we think it's somehow beneath us to spend our time sort of being public academics. Um, but I do see a real advantage in engaging actively with these debates, and I would support uh, any administrator who also saw our time used in that way as valuable and useful uh, for the common good. All right, wonderful. Um, it looks like there are uh, a handful of comments here from Kevin, so I, I just want to make sure that people, different people have the chance to ask some questions. So I think Gary Fine has his uh, hand up there. So if you want to ask a question, I'll then flip back to Facebook. John, um, you you ended your your talk with the cartoon in which you are facing a, a a massive crowd that presumably disagrees with you. But if we think about politics today, we we really yes that that uh, you know we we really see something quite different. I think in which large corporations. Uh, Facebook, for example, our, our host today, or Twitter or uh, YouTube, are systematically silencing voices that they don't agree with, but not voices like yours, not voices like ours. And so I'm wondering if you can speak to the politics of this. Uh, it, it would seem to me that, that one of the things that is happening, at least in the United States, is that corporate America, as we call it, has come down very much on the side of those who are suspicious of these kinds of claims. And they do it for their own purposes and their own networks. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the way in which social control operates in terms of uh, in terms of politics, whether it be Canadian or American politics. Thank, thank you very much, Gary. Um, I feel uh, grossly underprepared to actually uh, answer a question to one of the best uh, rumor and conspiracy theory and contemporary Latin scholars that the folklore has ever produced. So let's try this thing. Um, so one of the um, uh, one of the elements uh, I realize now that you pointed that out um, 
the me I'm afraid uh, in this graphic is supposed to be a conspiracy theorist, um, a, a great truth teller, um, not the me as in the narrator me. Oh, um, okay. So, uh, but uh, but to get to Gary's point, um, I feel that um, that one of the there's there's two or three sort of spinning uh, mechanisms inside of this. The first thing is that we. I'm not a media scholar, um, and there's been there are some fantastic media scholars out there who are attempting to understand this emergent um, uh, ecosystem um, that has um, that has developed these kinds of parallel ecosystems, um, and now the fracturing of social media into places like Parler and Gab um, and other closed systems, and so so I feel quite unprepared to talk to that. The one thing that I can talk about is that I think I share um, Gary's um, concern that a kind of robust engagement with critical uh, evaluation of everything from facts to conclusions within the political and the social realm um, should not be sacrificed in combating corrosive conspiracy theories. And I'm not sure exactly how we walk that delicate line, because one of the things, um, you know, one of the things that we should probably always keep in mind, and that my talk didn't directly address, is these, you know, the the vernacular communities um, and marginal vernacular communities who are attempting to actively engage with the world. They are conspiracy theory groups are at their heart problem solving groups. They really are an honest engagement with the trials and travails of people's lives, and they are attempting to solve these problems. And the fact that they might come to conclusions which we don't agree with should never take away from the fact that for most people and most of the people in the groups that I've been following are honestly engaged individuals who do believe that they want to make the world better. Now, when somebody like, say, Donald Trump um, or the Republican Party weaponize conspiracy theories in order to advance and secure certain kinds of political power, well, we can certainly see that as a kind of pernicious and a political conspiracy theory. But they're doing the same thing, John. They're they're trying to make the world better. <laughs> no, I mean, yep. you know, you're yep. laughing, but but you're laughing from your political perspective. That is from true. That is Donald true. Trump's political perspective, yeah. from the Republican Party's political perspective, they are trying to make the world better just as much as uh, Justin Trudeau or, or Joe Biden or, you know, anyone else. No, that is a good point. Um, and it is hard to intuit what somebody's intentions are. I suspect that if somebody's intentions are to destroy a functional democracy, that we might find that the world is not better for them having done so. But at the same time, it is true that the 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 that the outcome of conspiracy theories is never predictive. I think that's one of the key things. Um, that's the simply the presence of conspiracy theories or conspiracy thinking doesn't predict a kind of um, either violence, um, it doesn't predict a kind of corrosive political culture or an erosion necessarily. But I think um, as, as a lot of folklorists have pointed out, there is a kind of constant danger that lies in these things because of the tendency of identifying specific groups who are usually already socially and culturally marginalized as the great villains, and that these are the people that we need to watch out for, and that these are the people that we have to identify. So it tends to be the scapegoating, which is the most corrosive aspect um, to these kinds of narratives and the identifying of enemies, and then the implied or explicit suggestion of what to do with these enemies, either enemies inside um, or enemies above um, or enemies um, you know, within our own groups, these different kinds of social uh, locations of enemies. 
All right, wonderful. I'll pop back uh, and ask a few more questions that we have on Facebook, then come back to WebEx. So we have a couple more questions from Kevin, and then the next time I'll share that around uh, for some of the other people with questions too. Uh, so this is related to what you were just talking about a, a bit uh, with the politics and also maybe the um, intent and, and effect of them. One is how do we deal, oh, no, sorry, it's uh, are conspiracy theories only found uh, on people on the right side of the political spectrum? So are they only in right-wingers or uh, are they uh, broadly across different areas of the political spectrum? And uh, this is also from Kevin too, so I'll just combine these. What if conspiracy theorists are, are right? So if people are trying to help and sometimes there are outlandish things that might actually be true once in a while, so I'm wondering if you have uh, any thoughts on that for Kevin. Yeah, so the conspiracies are not, um, uh, conspiracy theories um, and conspiracy thinking are certainly not um, the property of any one group or any political persuasion one way or the other. Um, you know, uh, you, if you took a look at, um, if you took a look at any kind of, let's say, um, uh, uh, liberation type group, you'll find within their ranks tons of conspiracy theories. Um, so conspiracy theories um, are really, their expression is contained and is um, shared amongst group members um, based upon what they are concerned about, what their social, cultural, and economic threats that they themselves face which is what we find in say, um, how there are different kinds of conspiracy theories within uh, racialized communities, um, African-American, black Canadian communities, um, which are dissimilar from those um, shared with say the larger um, white communities. And that, that, and that reflects the different kinds of social, um, cultural and economic pressures that they face. So I would say that conspiracy theories um, are pretty much universal um, there's a kind of background radiation, much like um, contemporary legends and rumor. Um, and uh, what happens if a conspiracy theory ends up being right? Um, well, then it's just a theory. Um, and congratulations, you're right. So. All right, that's uh, well said. Thank you. So back to WebEx. I think we have another comment from Joel and then from Tim. So Joel, do you have another uh, comment or question? Sorry, thank you. John, the, the question I had, uh, kind of the, the cut from whole cloth point, so many of these current conspiracies, the QAnon types, uh, not so much the coronavirus, but the QAnon types, they're, they're like satanic panics, blood libel, things that were said about the Catholic Church, things which were said about other minority groups. So, I mean, obviously when we're looking at certain um, contemporary legends. It's easy to take, for instance, vanishing hitchhiker, and 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 find vanishing hitchhiker-like motifs back through in Roman times or or further. So the the view is well, this doesn't. Show, it's one myth that's that's mutated. It's it's that this is a motif that is popular and comes out of 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 the human psyche and and finds its its current form in modern society for different ways. It's therefore tempting on one hand to say the reason blood libel looks like satanic panic, looks like adrenochrome, looks like QAnon, looks like Pizzagate, is for that same reason. But so many of the people who are sharing this are possibly wallowing in the same pool that came out of anti-Jewish conspiracies, satanic panic conspiracies, etc. So it's not clearly it's not cut from whole cloth, but which cloth is it cut from? Are, are these is is your sense that these are the satanic panic of the day because people grew up with satanic panic and they're now making it about the, the demon crats? Or 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 is it that it's just it's this motif that's there in, in our psyche as as has found its way and this is its current form? Feel free to say you don't know or that it's both. Feel free to take the coward's way out, but I, I, I very much appreciate your view. Yeah. Th thanks, Joel. Um, <laughs> uh, I think I'm talking over my pay grade now. Um, <clears throat> but I think um, I think you're right that we've got as folklorists we can spot um, antecedents. Um, we're very good at it. Um, but one of the things that we sometimes lack is a um, is a convincing theory 
that says how they become operationalized at certain points um, and how people then use them as either um, templates or models or do the motifs um, move because they have their own kind of internal consistency which protects them from the erosion when they get added to and taken out of and added to and taken out of narratives. All of this, I think, is still up for some debate, or I'm just ignorant of the of the research um, with both of those are obviously options. So I think there's a couple of different ways that we can uh, take a look at this problem or, or this issue. Um, <clears throat> I got into an argument uh, with, uh, with a, a member of one of the CT groups where um, I gently pointed out that the George Soros that she was going on about is pretty anti-Semitic. Um, and this person said, it's not anti-Semitic, he just happens to be Jewish. And I was like, that's not really the kind of fine point that saves you here, person. Um, so there is this idea that we sometimes ascribe to people who are using these motifs as well as these story models, we sometimes ascribe to them the same complete repertoire of knowledge that let's say a professional scholar would have. And that's not necessarily a fair assessment of how people are constructing narrative out of the available resources there that are around them. Um, so I think, I think there's maybe two things Joel is right is that there are these motifs which are enduring uh, and very, very strong. Um, but we also have story models, these kinds of deep stories um, from which we can scaffold other stories on top of. And the blood libel seems to be one of those um, that acts as a kind, of, even if it's a bare bones mode, acts as a kind of scaffolding, which we can then hang a lot of detail and new narrative on top of. Um, and we shouldn't forget that we do have these basic sociological uh, models of scapegoating, which kind of dovetail into the narrative project itself. Um, and that's my coward's answer. Thank you, Joel. All right. Uh, up next, we have Tim, who has very patiently had his hand raised for a while now um, on WebEx. Uh, yeah. Uh, John, thanks so much for a, a really wonderful talk. It, it helps me uh, in my thinking, and it's crystallized a lot of ideas. Uh, I think uh, perhaps, uh, maybe not to the same extent as you, but I'm certainly getting a lot of uh, questions about uh, not only structure, but um, uh, uh, content aspects of these conspiracy theories. I, I have two questions. One perhaps uh, might be more of a comment. Uh, than a question, and that is, you know, when you look at these actants uh, who are the the villains or the threat or threateners uh, in these uh, comprehensive and interlocking narratives, uh, one of the things that seems to be lacking, at least uh, from what I've seen, is a motivation. Why is Bill Gates doing this? Why is George Soros doing this? Uh, and I was wondering if you had any uh, clues as to where to look for those motivating factors if they. Uh, exist. And then the, the second question goes to part of the conversation uh, that we've been having up to this point, uh, where the question is, at what point can we imagine that storytelling tips into real world action? So at what point does somebody take uh, action on this threat uh, and turn their strategy uh, into real world action? I'm going to have to run in a few minutes, but uh, uh, well, I, I'm eager to hear uh, just well, thoughts on these uh, well, probably much too big questions. Well, it's very kind uh, of you to attend, Tim. I know that you're busy, um, and I'm glad I gave you a shout out. It's uh, very sycophantic of me. Um, I didn't know he was here, folks. Um, but the um, okay. So the the thing about what's the motivation? I think there's two things. Uh, every once in a while, you do find things in say. Um, in the Gates material um, is that he is a secret profiteer because he owns all these patents. Now, why a gazillion billionaire needs more money, I don't know, um, except that, you know, greed is good, I suppose. Uh, the second one is that if he is an agent of the New World Order, then he is acting for evil and evil is its own reward, right? So he is acting to bring about either the Great Reset or the New World Order. 
So in that case, he, he has some kind of motivation. The other thing is that we could revert to sort of classic crappie and folk tales. Um, you know, why does the witch eat babies? That's what witches do, right? You know, it's just, he is a placeholder for evil. And he acts out of that sort of um, that sort of role based need. Um, and then, uh, sorry, I've just forgotten Tim's second part of his question. Uh, can Tim, can you remind me if you were? Um, yeah. So the the question was, uh, are there moments that we can see uh, where these virtual conversations, these storytelling uh, performances that are often quite collective, uh, have the uh, possibility of tipping? Uh, into real world action and maybe as a corollary as folklorists uh, what is our responsibility uh, in that chain of uh, uh, of observation uh, to potentially uh, raise our hand and say oh this could get ugly pretty quickly yeah um i've i've called um ostention um the great black box uh, sociological black box in folklore where it, um, it looks like it describes the very process that Tim wants it to, but it doesn't quite, that there is, um, that we haven't yet found the kind of metrics that would allow us to understand where talk is transformed into action. Um, because obviously there are hundreds of, th hundreds of thousands, millions of people uh, who ascribe to certain CTs, um, who pass along rumor, um, who um, pass along uh, cons um, contemporary legends, um, but they are not all ticking time bombs, right? And I think that gets back to Gary um, Allen Fine's point, is that we're not, I'm not doing this work in order to stigmatize and to put a bunch of people on an FBI watch list. Um, that's really not the point of this work. So I'm sorry, I can't answer your question, Tim. I don't know. I just know that we, um, I just know that we have certain tools as folklorists, and I think that we need to bear down on them even harder to try to maybe find some fellow travelers in places like Psych, um, in places you know, uh, like some of your big data people that I know you're working with that could give us better clues in terms of the micronization of the mechanisms within ostension. And I think we need that because obviously, um, uh, you know, the, the Canadian uh, gentleman who was arrested on Rideau Hall was just um, convicted. He just pled guilty a couple of weeks ago. Um, he was acting out these legend narratives and he drove his way through the gates and went looking to uh, talk to Trudeau armed with many weapons. So I, I share your concern, Tim, and I do hope that we can all work on that some more. Thank you. All right. So um, from Facebook, uh, Lynn McNeil had a question about 15 minutes ago and said, ha, I asked the same question as Tim. So I'll, I'll read this out uh, just in case there's a, a bit of a different take and also there's some information here. So, uh, folk, so this is from Lynn McNeil. Folklorist Jeannie Thomas recently gave a talk about CTs and she described CTs as encouraging improvisational extension. Uh, this seems to tie to your understanding of CTs as collective doings more than the stories. Any thoughts on how we can draw the line between story and action? Debate is one thing, violent action is another. Is there an identifiable point at which the story leads to action? Can we do anything useful uh, with that point? So if there's anything extra you want to address in that question, great. If, uh, if you think that the previous discussion covered most of that, uh, um, that's great too. I'll try to talk over my barking dog. Um, the, <laughs> yeah, um, so it, uh, Jeannie Thomas is, I think, going to publish that work um, fairly soon, and everybody should take a look for it because um, it's very important. Um, and she has a, I think she has a thing called a slap test, you know, how to, how to spot, um, you know, uh, conspiracy theories in your own life. Um, and um, and she, her talk is actually um, now archived and everybody can go and look at it. And maybe we'll link to that um, in this presentation when it itself becomes archived. Um, my only, this is only a hypothesis. My only guess would be if people move from telling narratives to simply identifying acts that need to be carried out. If we start to find that there's less, um, that there's less storytelling and there's much more just simple concentration on who's to blame and how we're going to get them, you know, because then that stops being a narrative and it starts being a kidnapping plan, right? Or a, a violent set of plans. Um, 
Now, of course, this also gets into difficult territory because what if people are just blowing off steam, right? What if people are just saying, you know, oh, I want to get them, you know, you know, I can talk trash about the Toronto Maple Leafs all day long, um, but that doesn't mean I want to murder the whole team every day. Um, so, you know, we, we do need to be careful and we need to be cautious in how we approach our scholarship and the work that we do. Um, but no, I'm no closer to answering uh, Lynn's question than I was to Tim's, I'm afraid. Wonderful, thank you. And it looks like we're just about out of time. Uh, the main other thing I think on Facebook was there was some appreciation for your uh, kin picture. So thank you for including that is uh, kind of mind bleach after uh, such a heavy topic in parts. Um, are there any other final thoughts or closing comments that people want to share? So we're basically down to last uh, last minute here. In that case, I want to say uh, thank you to the research office, to Marcom for all the support for this, and especially to Jennifer and Gerd as members of the FLIRT committee. And uh, very special thanks to uh, Dr. John Bodner for coming in and sharing your work here. Uh, it's been fa fantastic having you on, and I uh, look forward to the next step of your, uh, your research. Thank you very much, everybody. Really appreciate it. Take care. Have a great weekend.